So let's hold up our Bibles. This is my Bible. Holy and true like its author. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I can do in his strength what it says I can do. Today I'll be taught the word of God. I boldly confess. My mind is alert. My heart is receptive. And by grace I'll be changed. For Jesus' sake. Amen. Lord, we affirm that you are, the ch- you are an unchanging God who is in the process, who is in the business of changing us. And no change can happen unless we are in the vine, abiding in the vine. No change can happen, Lord, unless we are by faith abiding in your words, drinking by faith the living water that you offer, the bread of life, eating from the bread of life by faith. And you have come to give us your peace, your joy, and to have it in the full. To have true, full and lasting peace and joy that this world cannot offer. Even, amongst, um, even amidst the difficulties of life. Lord, all of us Christians have tasted that wonder, that peace that transcends all underst- human understanding. And I just pray, Lord, that whatever, I'm praying for myself too, God, that you would return to us the joy of your salvation, of the relationship and the grace that we have in you. If that is waning and fading or not existing at the moment. And that the giver of power and strength, and joy and peace, you, O oh God, would the giver would get the glory. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So you'll see that our dash cams are the craze today. Uh, Probably not that many. (laughs) They they are so cheap and more and more people are getting them. Um, And I think they're actually quite good as you can turn the car on, the camera starts up and begins to record automatically and it records everything you see through the windscreen. Um, It's the very widescreen Um, lenses these days and even come with high definition Um, and and so uh, they're quite good but now but I'm not here to talk about dash cams now imagine but if you had uh, had a, a memory implant a little device that was planted into your brain while you were in your mum's womb and it records everything your eye sees throughout your whole life. And when you die, the implant is given to the, a professional cutter, editor, who edits all your memories into a feature-length memorial that is viewed by loved ones at your funeral and given to them as a keepsake. Imagine. Imagine how life-changing that knowledge would be, knowing that that's happening, that you have that little implant in you. This is actually what happens in the 2004 science fiction movie called The Final Cut, with Robin Williams in it. It's quite a good movie. But how would you feel, though, knowing that, that one day someone will have access to everything you have said seen and done. If you just ask, ponder on that question to any human being, there's this uncomfortability, and it really testifies to what? That we are sinful 
human beings. If we were morally good, we would have no problem with that, would we? We've got no secrets. No, you know what I'm saying? Nothing to cover up. But unfortunately it's not so. So in the movie, there was, a, there was a certain age that the parents had to inform their child that they have the implant. Because this was the parent's decision, not the child. And the response of some of the children when they found out was suicide. Living life with the knowledge that all you do will be fully known. That what you do in darkness will be brought out into the light was all too much to handle. Now this is only fiction, at least for now. But when it comes to God, it isn't fiction, is it? It is as real as the clothes that you're wearing. The big difference is that with God, he not only sees and knows all we see and do and say, but what goes on, he also sees what goes on inside where no one sees, in our thoughts and our motivations. And it is with this knowledge that he will judge the entire world. Only he, with that knowledge, is suitable and capable to judge the world. Look at Hebrews 4.13. And no creature is hidden from his sight, talking about God, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him whom we must give an account. Now that nakedness and exposure is not just he sees us in the nutty in the shower, you know what I'm saying? You're talking about a transparency of heart and mind. 1 Corinthians 4, 5 says this, therefore, Paul says this, therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time, for before the Lord, before the Lord comes, sorry, do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light, this is when he comes, the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the what? Heart. Then each one will receive his commendation from God. Praise God that for Christians, that exposure will only bring commendation, not condemnation. Isn't that wonderful? That's why the all-knowingness of God is not a paralyzing, fearful thing. There's no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. There will be just commendation. Such is our all knowing God. Today we continue to examine God's character and the characteristics that he has shared with us, humans, as people who are made in his image. And we've called them God's communicable attributes and um, that attributes that he has shared to some small degree with us finite humans. And we've been looking at this, uh, and we've, we're going to be looking at his mental attributes um, his knowledge, his wisdom, and his truth, truthfulness. So the, the sermon title is The God Who Is Like Us, Part 2, The Knowledge, Wisdom, and Truthfulness of God. Now, um, the main focus will be on the knowledge, then a little bit on the wisdom, then virtually not much on the truthfulness because we looked at the truthfulness of God when we looked at the revelation of God and how God has revealed himself in and through his word and stuff like that. So last week we looked at the spirituality of God or as John 4.24 puts it, God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. So what is God? God is a spirit who has no body like we do. God is spirit means that he exists as a being that is not made of any matter, he has no parts or dimensions. We also saw that God is spirit, means that he is unable to be perceived by our body's senses. In other words, God, our infinite creator, is invisible to us finite creatures. And part of, so part of God's spirituality is the truth that God is invisible. 
The total, let me say this, the total essence of God's spiritual being cannot be seen by us or anyone. The Apostle Paul writes these words of praise, 1 Timothy 1.17. This is just a recap from last week. To the King of ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honour and glory forever and ever. Amen. Then he says at the end of the letter, 1 Timothy 6.16, God who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see. Now, to him be honour and eternal dominion. Amen. And so we, we also looked at the fact that there must be referring to the very essence of God because there are times in the Bible where God has made himself, he revealed at least uh, an outward manifestation of his glory. So, um, but no one has ever seen or can see the very essence of Such is the glory, the power, and this is the unimaginable uh, holiness of our great God. So though God is invisible and has no body, he still has a mind, doesn't he? He still has a mind, a mind without a brain. Think about that. He still has a mind, and a mind that comprises of, of knowledge and wisdom and truth. So let's look at, number one, the knowledge of God. Let's get into it. The knowledge of God. Our God is an all-knowing God. He is using the Latin omniscient, all-knowing. Science just means in Latin knowledge. He's all-knowing. Um, one of Job's friends, Elihu, is that his part? Elihu? Elihu? Rightly states that God's knowledge is perfect. Look at Job 37.16. Do you know the balancings of the clouds, the wondrous works of him, talking about God, who is perfect in knowledge? See, our knowledge is imperfect, isn't it? But God alone has perfect knowledge. Now, this relates to truth because our knowledge is not only flawed, but it's limited, isn't it? It's limited... And it's flawed in some sense. Not all flawed. We, we do know truth. We do know facts. We do know things. Science brings about, discovers a lot of wonderful facts. But it's still God's knowledge is perfect, always truthful, and it's unlimited. So perfect knowledge cannot be subtracted from or added to, can it? The Apostle John in the New Testament simply states in 1 John 3.20 that God knows everything. He states very clearly that God knows everything. And, and we all know that. God's, for, God's knowledge makes all the libraries in the world look like a matchbox. God's knowledge makes all the information on the internet, which is gigantic, look like a local newspaper. His, his knowledge makes all the quantum physics and all the knowledge in academia look like a kindergarten curriculum. Nothing or no one can compare to the knowledge of our great God. God knows fully himself and he knows everything else fully, actually and possibly. Possible and actual knowledge. See, only God can fully know God. Think about this. Only God can fully know God. God is an infinite being, therefore only God can know and understand completely God. Infinite understanding, infinite. This truth is implied by the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 10-11. Think about, read these verses with me as we ponder on the fact that only God can fully know God. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. So anything we get regards to true knowledge of God has to come by the Spirit. That's what Paul's saying. Don't get puffed up in your own knowledge, you're saying to Corinthians. Remember they were getting puffed up? No. 
you are recipients of God showing you those things. For the spirits, but he says the reason why is because for the spirit searches everything, even the depths of God, which no one else can. You hear what it's saying? No one else can search the depths of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except the spirit of that person which is in him? So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. And that's why we need God's spirit to reveal knowledge of God to us. See, the, only God, of course God the Holy Spirit there, knows God completely. The truth that God knows himself fully is also suggested in the Apostle John's statement in 1 John 1, 5. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is what? Light. And in him, the, in him is no darkness at all. Yes, light here speaks of moral purity without a doubt, that God is morally flawless. We'll get that into God's... Uh, moral attributes in the next coming weeks. But it also speaks about God's knowledge as well. That he has full knowledge or awareness. That's what it also means that God is light. He has full knowledge, full awareness of everything. God is light means that he is entirely holy and entirely self-aware. Friends, it is good to acknowledge that unlike God, our self-awareness is so small and so limited. God not only knows himself fully, but he knows all things fully, including us. All things that have existed, all things that does exist, and all things that will exist is fully known by God. All things that has and is and will happen, not just exist, but will happen, God knows fully as well. 2 Chronicles 16, verse 9. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth. What does that mean? It sort of has the hint of honorary presence, but it's... He sees everything. I mean, of course, using human language runs. God doesn't need to run. He's omnipresent, therefore he sees everything throughout the whole earth. Job 28, 24. For he, that's God, looks to the ends of the earth and sees everything under the heavens. Then Matthew chapter 10, 29 to 30. Jesus said these words, Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But even the hairs of your head are all numbered. You know, and for most of us, not all, most of us have hair that we can never count. <laughs> even people who are a bit light on, which I'm heading towards, Still, you just can't count it. You know what I'm saying? It's just getting to the places that it's just... Uh, if We can't count those sort of things, but God can. God knows fully the tiny details of everyone's lives. That's what it's saying. Matthew chapter 6, 7 to 8. Jesus said these words again also. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they'll be heard by their many words. Do not be like them, for as for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. You know what I'm saying? It's like he, he knows our needs. He knows our needs intimately. Everything about us. Such is the knowledge of our wonderful Father. Matthew chapter 10, verse 30. We've done that one. Look at Psalm 139. It's in your booklet. At um, least the four, first four verses. But you can just listen to the words. You've, you've heard it this morning rather than turn there. But Psalm 139, we'll read it again. 
O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. So hear the actions, you know, sitting and rising. So you know the actions that I do. And of course, not just that, you know you discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and acquainted with all and, and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O oh Lord, you know it all together. Because before we actually speak, we think, don't we? Well, hopefully we do. <laughs> um, you know, thought, then words come out, and so God knows the thoughts before even words enter onto our tongue. Um, Verse 5, you hand me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. I cannot understand. I cannot comprehend it. It's too amazing. See, God's all-knowing reaches beyond the past and the present, but he even reaches to the, even the future, of course, which we already know. Isaiah 46, 9 to 10. Um, we've read this often late, lately. Remember the Isaiah 46, 9 and 10, which is not up there, sorry. Actually, all the verses now you're just going to have to listen to. Um, Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning, from ancient times, things not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will accomplish all my purposes. So he not just knows the future, he determines the future. He's such our great God. It is also important to know that God's knowledge is different than ours. Not only in having full knowledge and we having partial knowledge, but that his knowledge is always fully present in his consciousness. And we've sort of talked about this in, in talking about his omnipresence, but God's knowledge is always present in his consciousness. What this means is that we, if we were to ask God how many grains of sand are on all the beaches on the planet, or number the stars in the sky, he doesn't need to count them all quickly, like some kind of giant computer, nor does he need to think and recall the numbers to mind since he had not thought about it for a while. You know what I'm saying? This knowledge, like all all, all his other knowledge, is eternally present in his consciousness. Remember, as we were about it, his knowledge never fades, never improves. It's just, it's just get your head around that. It's such otherworldly, isn't it, from our existence? But what about those verses that? So, but we ask the question: What about those verses that God promises to forget our sins? Isaiah forty three twenty five. He says, "I, I am He who blots out your transgressions for my own sake." That's wonderful, isn't it? And I will not remember your sins. Now, I know that you know what that means. Yeah, yeah. God not remembering our sins anymore does not mean he does not know them. Of course he knows them. You know know what I'm saying? His knowledge never diminishes. He can't forget things. What it does mean is that God will not hold that knowledge of our sins against us. You know what I'm saying? So he's using the term of remembering no more, forgetting about it. He won't hold our sins against us anymore. That knowledge of what we did in the past is God, meaning no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. On the day of judgment, I am not going to use my knowledge of your sins to condemn you. If you're a Christian. If you aren't a Christian, it will. That knowledge will condemn you. Justly. Look at Jeremiah 7.31. And they have built the high places of Topheth, which is in the valley of the son of Hinnon, to burn their sons and their daughters in the fire. This is time when they had child sacrifice in their idol worship, which I did not command, nor did, I, nor did it come into my mind, the translation says. Now, people use that to say, there you go. God says, nor did it come into my mind. So there was this knowledge of, you know what I'm saying, this child sacrifice that didn't even enter his mind, so therefore he's not all-knowing. And I know I'm speaking to people who already know that that's not true. Ultimately, the translation can mean 
nor did it come into, into my heart. Which ultimately what he means is, it's not, not coming into God's mind more than likely means that God did not wish or desire it. Of course he knew about it, but he did not wish or desire it to happen. God knows fully himself and all things actual and all things possible. Next, number two, uh, a lot more briefer, is the wisdom of God. The wisdom of God, different to the knowledge of God. Though God can't be all wise unless he's all knowing. But God is all wise, isn't he? Meaning that God always chooses the best goals and the best means to those goals. Let me say that again. God chooses the best goals and the best means to achieve those goals. The best, the ultimate, the perfect. Every decision God makes is infinitely wise. They will always bring about, God's decisions will always bring about the best results, at least from God's ultimate perspective. How often do we put God's wisdom on trial, humans? Let me say that again. God's decisions will always bring about the best results. This is what it means from God to be all wise, perfect in wisdom. The best results and the results will come through the best possible means. Romans 16, 27, Paul says to the, in a benediction, to the only wise God, be glory forevermore through Jesus Christ. Amen. All wisdom flows from him. And when you're in separation, out of relationship with God, human wisdom becomes folly. God has never been perplexed by any problem whatsoever. Nor can he be, nor can he be counseled by any person or by any being in the universe as to say, you need a little bit more wisdom there, God. Really? Creation itself displays the wisdom of God, doesn't it? Psalm 104 verse 24. Psalm 104 verse 24 says this, O Lord, how manifold are your works. In wisdom have you made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. It takes infinite wisdom to create such a world. Such complexity and design. Salvation also displays the wisdom of God, doesn't it? Listen to Paul's words in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 23 to 24. Paul's comparing the, the wisdom of the world to the wisdom of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 23 to 24. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and folly to Gentiles. Hear that? The message of Christ, the, 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 the gospel is a stumbling block to Jewish people, even today, isn't it? And it's folly, it's unwise, it's seen as unwise and stupid to Gentiles. But to those, he goes on to say, but to those who are called, called by God, both Jews and Greeks, both Jews and Gentiles, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. So when, when Christ calls you and God calls you into fellowship with his son and you get saved, you realise that that message is not stupid but it's wise. It's, Christ is not weak by dying on the cross but his power. His death on the cross is not a stumbling block. It is power to save me. It's powerful. It's the only way that I can be saved is through Jesus' so-called weakness on the cross. For us Christians, we know that the wonderful message of salvation and what God has done through Christ is wise, not foolish. So don't be ashamed to speak about it, though people will see the story of Adam and Eve and Christ 
being born of a Virgin Mary and doing miracles and dying on a cross for our sins, being punished, rising again. People will mock that and say that's foolish and unwise. It's not. The simple gospel message of what Jesus Christ has done for us reflects an amazing plan of God which in its depths of wisdom surpasses anything humans or angels can ever imagine. So that's why Paul says um, in Romans 11.33, Oh, the depth of the riches and the wisdom and knowledge of God. And so much so, listen to these words. If you want to turn there, turn to Ephesians chapter 3. Let's look at this verse. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 8 to 11. The gospel message is meant to display the wisdom of God, not just to fellow human beings, but to supernatural beings. And the church is the theatre of the wisdom of God in the angelic realm. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 8 to 11. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to me, Paul says, to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Isn't that a beautiful description of the gospel message that we have? The unsearchable riches of Christ. Verse 9, and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things so that through the church, hear that? Through the church, through us, for you and me, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known. And we sort of think, okay, I'm waiting for it, made known to other people. That is true, but not here. Made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. That is referring to the demonic realm. This was according to the eternal purpose that he realised in Christ Jesus our Lord. So what God is doing through his blood-brought church and, their, and, and, and the wisdom of God displayed in their salvation speaks not just to the world around us, but speaks to the angelic world as well. They're sitting and watching and beholding God's magnificent wisdom in what God's doing. It just elevates, exalts the church to a magnificent role and job description. Wisdom, see, wisdom is a communicable attribute, isn't it? In that God shares it with us. And so, but also as a Christian, the thing is, we, our, our, what we need to do is realise, like, is to ask for wisdom, don't we? We need to understand that human wisdom is not God's wisdom. James 1.5 says, if anyone you lacks wisdom, meaning godly wisdom let him ask god who gives generous to all without see god wants us christians to be solomons who with who in humility know their lack of wisdom and ask god like little dependent children to gain more of his wisdom and of course that will be via his word it's never via it's never not via his word and lastly and very briefly the truthfulness of god let me just say this, God is the true God and that all his knowledge and words are both true and the final standard of truth. Just uh, a couple of verses, Jeremiah 10.10, 10. Jeremiah 10.10, 10. but the Lord is a true God. He is the living God and the everlasting King. What a beautiful, beautiful verse. 
Jeremiah 10.10. 10. Proverbs 30, verse 5. Every word of God proves true. Of course, if his person is true, utterly true, then of course his words will be true. But every word of God proves true. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. Then Jesus affirms this in, in his prayer to the Father in John 17, verse 17. Sanctify, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. Your word is truth. Because, because God and, and his word is true, we Christians ought to be truthful people. Just a good reminder, isn't it? Um, we are being, Colossians 3 says that we are being renewed in the knowledge after the image of its creator. And one of the aspects of his image is his truthful, isn't he? And so one way we can be glorifying to God is that we are truthful people. We love truth. We are also truthful in what we say and stay clear from any deception or lies. Um, Psalm 15, 1 and 2 says, O Lord, who shall sojourn in your tent? Who shall dwell on your holy hill? He who walks blamelessly and does what is right and speaks truth in his heart. And then Revelation, of course, verse 8, to show how it important or how devastating the world says lying is not that not that bad doesn't it we have layers of lying there's little white lies we say white because it doesn't seem too bad and remember i remember that sermon that i preached in acts from an ananias sapphire and i said there's no such thing as white lies they're all black in revelation 21 verse 8 one of the lists let me just read it but as for the cowardly the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars. Their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. So you have murderer and you have liars. What is their culture? <laughs> all of them deserving for hell. Wow. See that? Why? Because... Lying not only harms our relationships with people, but it dishonours God. It belittles His glory that we're meant to reflect. You see that? So often we think that lying's bad because it, it is bad because of how it affects others. But lying ultimately belittles and diminishes God's glory because we're meant to be images of bearing His glory, being reflectors of His image, which ultimately one reflecting aspect is truthfulness. It dishonours God by belittling his glory that we are to reflect, diminishing his, the glory of his truthfulness. So let me just conclude by saying these two statements. God being all-knowing is both utterly fearful or gloriously wonderful. Depends on, your, on whether Christ is yours or not. Depends on whether those sins that God knows all about have been forgiven or not. Also, God being all wise and completely true means we can trust him and not question or doubt him and his ways. This is so true. We may not fully understand all that God's doing, but if we just remember that God is all powerful, God is all loving, and God is all wise, he knows what he's doing. As I said before, Every decision God makes is infinitely wise. Both in the outcome and how the means on how he achieves that outcome. So let's be people who don't put God on trial and question his wisdom. Let's pray. Father, we just ask now, once again, give us hearts of worship and to... Behold in the heart our great God, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.